So, um, many of you probably heard when you were growing up, oh, don't complain. I had to walk to school five miles. <laughs> so for those people that were born in the early 1900s um, in the United States, they had to deal with uh, World War I, uh, the flu epidemic, they dealt with prohibition, uh, floods, World War II, the Great Depression, I almost forgot. Um, for the village of Manchog, they had two additional things. And the first was in 1922, when there were 1,600 people living in a one mile square area that is the National Historic District now, um, the BBNR Night Company decided to close its Massachusetts manufacturing operations and shuttered the three mills that were here. Now, you have to remember the housing was all owned by the mill company. A lot of the stores were um, up towards where the post office is. So the population went from 1600 in 1922 down to 400. And many of the tenement houses were vacant. And the people migrated down to what is called the flat. So the flats are basically just south of here, and it was where, in the 1870s, John Darling, who had been descended from one of the first people to settle in the Manchog area, started selling off some of his land to private people who started building stores and tenement housing. And so it was private, multifamily housing that was in the flats area. And so that was what was occupied in 1924. So if, if I say fire and I say man chicken man, right, 1975? So that is not the fire I'm talking about, but that fire did kill 80,000 chickens and released on many, many hundreds of rats into the river. Uh, so the only thing in common with the fire we're going to be talking about is the loss of chickens. So thanks to Mark Dunleavy, and actually his wife Deb and Mark own this building, and so thanks for keeping it alive. But Mark was able to go up to the top of the tower for me on a sunny day last week and take this shot. So that's Mumford Hill. And if you look at the bottom of Mumford Hill, you're gonna see that house that is kind of looking directly at us, where there's usually a stockade fence that's fallen into the road. So just keep an eye on that because we're gonna see that in some of the old pictures. Um, and then there's Beck's Garage, just for orientation. And uh, Morris Road which leads down to Veterans Park. And then that's St. John's Anglican Church, which up until 2013 was St. Anne's Catholic Church, right on Main Street. So now we go back. So this is a view from what is now the station number two of the uh, fire station. And you can see where you are. You'll see that mill where the end of the little red dot is. Um, and then, oh, and oop, well, I guess it is. So there's St. Anne's Church uh, right there in the tower. So on April 16th, 1924, it was a normal day, just like any other day. And people in the village set about doing what they were going to be doing because it was actually Easter week. So now just as a little aside, Easter is always the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. So that's why right. we had Easter weeks ago, and these people were celebrating in April. So this is the Wednesday, and the next day would be Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday. And you can see Okay, so this is looking down Main Street, and the three tenement houses on your right are still there. This big store on your left is an example of the multi-use 
housing and storefronts that were privately built, not by a mill company. And so to the left of the screen would be Morris Road. And then you would be looking down, you'll see a tree on the right after those multifamilies. That's where Bex Garage is in that vicinity right now. So here's a great image of the big store. So you can see the store space on the bottom. And this building uh, was there in the late 60s, early 70s on that corner when it was torn down. This was um, going down Main Street on the same side. Again, you can see housing on the second and third floor. And then here, this big roof behind this little building is actually eight Morris Road. So if anyone knows the Lewandowski property today, that big multifamily was on that property. And then this property here is the blue house that's currently on the left side of Main Street, the orphan house. And this cute little big shop was actually next door. Um, the blue house had actually been uh, built by Dr. Cooliard, who had been uh, uh, the doctor in the village forever, until he died of the flu. <laughs> and then this is an image from the west side of Main Street in what is now the little store just north of Beck's Garage. So you can see this is another big uh, tenement house. This one was owned by the BB&R Night Company. And then uh, you can see again the roof line that's on Morse Road. So what we're trying to do is just give you an idea of what the village looked like because it doesn't look like it does now. So this picture is probably around 1903, 1904. And it's taken from up around 11 Mumford Street, but across the street from high elevation. And I just want you to take a look at the church uh, property. You see the church? And the, and the rectory and the convent. And so uh, they were wooden, they were quite nice. And then this is Whiteness Road. So if you were to go up to the four corners and take a right right now, there used to be three brick houses. Now there are two houses that aren't brick and one remaining brick, but just to give you an idea of what the village looked like. And then that's the roof for that big multi-use store housing that I mentioned was on Morris Road on Main Street. And then I had told you there was one big house at 8 Morris Road, but there were three. So you can see all the roofs there. Um, so those were boarding houses and multifamily homes. And then, uh, and so this was the outside of the rectory. Um, St. Anne's Catholic Church was a mission of St. Dennis until 1883. Uh, well, 1900, but in 1883, the mission church built its own facility. They built St. Anne's and the rectory. Um, and then around 1905 or so, they ended up building the convent, which then had a school attitude as well. So it was, you know, quite nice. Um, and then off to the left here, you can see the proximity of some of the other houses. There's at least two houses in close proximity to the rectory um, right there. And then this was the convent. And it was the Sisters of the Holy Ghost. And they taught school to the parochial school children. So 144 students were enrolled in that parochial school in 1906. So you have to remember, there were 1,600 people in one mile square area. There was a public school that built out of there in District 5. It was built in 1899. But there was also this parochial school. So this is just to kind of give you an idea of what everything was like. And this next shot is actually one of my favorites. So you can really see the church and the rectory. And you also want to make note of the trees. There's a lot of very mature trees. Um, and those will be important when we get to the popular pictures. <laughs> and this is just a side view. So it was a big church. And it was pretty regal inside. It was gorgeous. And then if we just continue past the church property, um, this is the house right next to Busquets Garage. Actually, Ted Busquets lives in this house. So you can see the proximity. So 
that church there was more than the parking lot of the church that's there now. And the church that's there now is more where the rectory and the convent were. So when they rebuilt in the 50s, it, it just kind of got flipped. And then continuing down the road, uh, this barn area is where currently J.D. Busquette and Sons is today. So that's Jarvis Ave. Um, and this is uh, Seven Jarvis Ave. That house is still there today. But if you look to the left, you can see the convent. So again, it's giving you an idea of wooden structures, close proximity, um, and mostly all privately owned. So uh, the man that built that house is the guy with the derby hat near the front door. So he died in 1905, so that picture is before 1905. <laughs> um, and then you can see the multifamily roofs again. And then this is Darling uh, Jarvis Ave and then Darling Lane in the background. So that would be the current Zydema house that's still on Darling Lane. Yep. And then this is gonna settle a lot of confusion. There's the hotel and the bakery. So it's right across from Busquets Garage. And it was gorgeous. Um, so just a little aside, because I'm a big genealogist, but the bakery, our own select board member, Jeff Bannon's mother-in-law, her father ran that bakery. It was his father that had started it, so just a little aside. And he also commented to me, why is it when I ask someone from around here where they're from, everybody says Sutton, unless they're from Manchot. <laughs> Very clearly say they're from Manchot, including his mother-in-law. And then the last area where the fire <laughs> happened. So this is the small house between um, Darling Lane and Jarvis Ave. And the taller building was the Sunshine the Baptist Social Club that also provided insurance for people. You could be a member and it would provide widow benefits and also Catholic school tuition. And that was a, an organized group with from Canada all the way around wherever there were French Canadians. So, does everybody kind of know where we are? <laughs> There's a lot down there, right? It's not there anymore. And when I started uh, researching this fire, I don't know, eight years ago, I thought it was in a completely different area. Um, I had a newspaper article the one that's there in the frame over on the other side. Um, and then my mother said to me, you know, did you decide to look forward to some other days to see if they still ran the story? And they did run the story for several weeks. And it ran in Canada, it ran in California, it ran in Nebraska, it ran in Kansas, because they, they referenced the destruction as if it was the French fleeing the enemy during World War I. That's how decimated the area was from this fire. So now what I did for you is again, like everybody know where they are, the red area, and for those who are colorblind, it might be brown, um, that is the area where the fire basically <coughs> happened. Now, it raged for three hours, and so there was a lot of smoke damage. But if you go to the top to the left, um, you can see that we're up there in the middle, and so it's down going towards Douglas. And then I did put a legend, so A is showing you where the St. Anne's was, B is showing you where the Manchild Hotel was. I have sound effects. <laughs> so, now. Remember, it's, a, it's the 1920s, so you're not getting a hot lunch at your school. You're going home for lunch. Why? Because you're only within walking distance. So at around noon, as 55 children exited the St. Anne's parochial school and four nuns who were their teachers sat down for lunch, three different individuals claimed to have witnessed the beginning of the conflagration. 
Now, the one that's most interesting to me is the young boy who was unidentified, who's inside Conley's garage, and says he discovered the blaze as it started, declaring some material on the workbench near the stove caught fire. <coughs> and in an instant, the flames were creeping swiftly along the oil-soaked floor and mounting the walls. So, he could have been that old because if he was about 18, he might have thrown some water on it or, I don't know, stamped on it. So, I'm going to assume the kid was, let's say he's 12 and he panics. So, the next person who claims that they were the first to see the fire was a woman who ran a boarding house. That was one of those ones on Morse Road that I showed you. There were those three big boarding houses. And she claimed she saw smoke seeping over the chimney, and she called the local firemen. And they realized that um, they weren't going to be able to cope with it. And there's a reason for that. Because when the mill closed, they turned off the pump for the water. So the flats didn't have a way to get water down here because the pumps were turned off. And the insurance companies weren't insuring the people for their property because there was no pumps, so there was no water. So, um, so she calls, and they decide they can't do much. And at the same time, this gentleman named Alfred Dennis, who lived on Morse Road, and the house is still there. It's a little cape, kind of when you go up on the left. It's just a little bit up right before Barbara Lee's that's house. He saw the fire. He rushed to the Mantog Hotel because his mother-in-law lived there, and she was in a panic, and he knew there were chemicals that he could dump onto this fire to try to put it off. And then he called both the Whitensville and Milby Fire Departments, and then he ran, he ran to the tower, and he started ringing the bell. So there's the bell. He's ringing. Everybody better get going. Something big is going into town. So now, we have a fire. <laughs> so, at 12.15, Conley's garage was a mass of flames, and the fire, soaring through the roof, swept backward by a strong breeze over a large tenement. That's most likely one of the tenement houses on Morse Road, the one that's being managed by Elizabeth Kibbe, and is actually owned by John LaTown. And for anyone who grew up in Manchester, uh, not related to Nancy Kitty, I'm pretty sure. I've been trying to link that, and I can't. So, so now it goes back to Morse Road, and then the fire sweeps back westward and ignites the buildings on the west side of... Reported by the Evening Gazette, within minutes, 
of the dismissal of the children for lunch, their school and convent was a pile of smoking ruins. As soon as it was seen that there was a danger of the church being ignited, Father Paul Hanatel, the pastor, rushed from the rectory, which was next door to Conley's garage, into the church. Aided by the parishioners, the sacred vessels of the church, church records, and vestments were taken to the mat home located at 39 Main Street between Jarvis Avenue and Darling Lane. Now, just as an aside, I wondered why that house, right? It's not that far away. The Matts had a daughter that was also a member of the Sisters of the Holy Ghost. And that order were the teachers in the convent. And their daughter was not a teacher here, but I believe the family probably had a close relationship with both the sisters and the priest. And maybe Mr. Matt was one of the parishioners helping, but they were able to uh, get a lot of the stuff out of the church. So when the steeple <coughs> crashed to the earth shortly after the building caught fire, the bell fell into the street, severing a hose line. Father Hanatel and others stayed in the church, retrieving items even after the steeple fell, and were able to um, escape right before the roof caved in. So, so with Whitingsville as the closest fire department, it would be expected they would have been first on scene. The honor belongs to the Millbury volunteer crew of Captain Richard Army, Mason Shaw, Louis Gabry, and William Horn, and I'm sure others who are not named. <laughs> the crew reached the fire at 12.30 after a record run from Millbury. It was said they made the run in 11 minutes. The inability of the Whitensville Fire Department to send their new triple action pump was because they had sent the wheels to Worcester 15 minutes before. <laughs> So years later, the Whitensville Fire Department transferred the same engine to the Sutton Fire Department, who still owns it today. It's the historic Seagrave Fire Truck housed in Station 2, right here in Manchog. We're trying to figure out if anyone remembers how to drive it. So the Millbury crew, it was stated, had water on the fire before their machine was stopped. The crew had stopped at the Millbrook with a thousand feet of hose. Their second hose was too short. Now remember, they had to stop at the brook because there was no pump to get the water down here. So they had to throw the hoses in the brook in order to get the water to go through the, through the hoses to get on the fire. So when the Whitens Oil crew arrived with their chemical and hose wagon in charge of Chief William Aldrich, two additional lines were run. Other responding fire departments were Worcester, and you can see them all up there, um, Douglas. William Schuster closed the Douglas Mills to let uh, his employees just come and help battle the fire. So, because it's the old days and people used to know what they needed to do, this one individual named Truffle Donay knew, oh my God, we need more water. And he ran up and opened the dams. So let's get that Manchaw Pond Dam, let's get Whitey's Reservoir Dam, let's get them all open so we can just get a, a ton of uh, water coming down for these pumper trucks. So, Engineer William D. Horn of Millbury declared he had never seen a fire harder to battle than the one in Manchog. The wind blew from every direction. One moment you would think you had the fire just about stopped and the wind would shift. You would change your water lines to meet the new direction of the fire and almost before you got set, the wind would change and direction completely. So that's kind of a cool picture that was in the paper. It's a little bit uh, blurry, but if anyone is descended from any of those firemen, there's your great great grandfather. So Captain Richarmy is on uh, the right side. So it was a stubborn battle at the Manitoba Hotel. <coughs> I remember that beautiful hotel. Um, and the Millbury fire crew was stationed there, and Whitensville was more up here, where, you know, where the intersection of Morse Road was. So had the hotel fully ignited, the fire may have jumped to the homes on Mumford Hill. The Manitoba Hotel was saved when Whitensville fireman John Spencer learned 100 pounds of gunpowder in one of the outbuildings on the property. He ran, he found it, and he tossed it into the water trench that used to run on that side of Main Street. And so he 
basically got it all wet and it didn't explode. But the wall against which the powder had been stored had been severely scorched. And the powder, it would have surely exploded. So in several instances, the flames jumped some houses only to completely destroy others next door. Even the firemen cannot explain the circuitous route of the fire which charred the landscape. The fire was stopped at the Busquet home. That's the one that was on Josh's ad with that nice guy in the bowler hat that died in 1905. Reportedly, at a dresser that had a rosary. I don't know what that was. Could just be that someone put water on the house. Um, a letter from their son, Levi, who was a student in Quebec at the time, supports that this home had smoke damage, but was being occupied again by early May. So that home wasn't really destroyed. They were obviously able to get right back in within a week or two. Flames at the Lesage home on Darling Lane were stopped when Mrs. Lesage, in a panic as her bedridden husband could not be removed from the home, placed a picture of Christ in the window. And sure enough, fire stopped. It didn't burn down. But again, maybe someone was putting water on the, on the house. Interestingly, Constable Albert McDonald's home which I pointed out is the current home of Ted Busquet, right next to Busquet's garage, um, was in the direct path of the fire and was missed. But all the furniture that they had so quickly rushed to get out and put into the backyard was destroyed. <laughs> As was the Gendron home that was right behind it and the Busquet barn, which was in the picture where I showed you Busquet's garage is now located. That was the Busquet barn. The Matt home, the little house between Jarvis and Darling Lane, where the sacred vessels were placed, was completely skipped. It didn't get touched. But the St. John the Baptist Hall next door, burned to the ground. And the bakery and the hotel across the street, they had some damage, but they were, they were saved. So this picture here, um, I'm just showing you, see the, see the tree kind of underneath where it says, I don't know if it says Oxford Realty. Mm -hmm. So the three, two families on your right are still there. The three buildings after them are the ones that burnt. Those were, one was owned by BBNR Knight, one was a private residence, and the other had been bought by the Oxbridge Realty in the 1922 auction of all the property in the town. And so when you are looking at pictures and pictures and pictures, you start to notice things. And one was the, um, the tree in the um, telephone pole. That's how I knew it was the right area for the previous picture. So accolades were given to the telephone exchange workers that were in Douglas. Because the first thing that happened with such a hot fire is that the telephone cables were melted. So you can't call for help. So the ingenious people decided to make a car chain. In other words, we need another alarm. And they would, we need another alarm. We need another alarm. Four miles down to this uh, telephone station. And these women worked through the night. Uh, it was Sarah Frost. She's standing, and she was also a TNG correspondent. And Miss Blanche St. Andre. And the, the newspaper said, frantic relatives, homeless Manchogians, assistant newspaper men, local businesses trying to reach their customers, more relatives, flashing signal lights, excited voices, rush, rush, rush. These two ladies stayed calm and collected. And the telephone repairmen were on the job before the ruins stopped smoldering. And Deputy Chef Sheriff Andrew Keith was placed in charge. There was some minor looting, but it was, it was put in check. So, um, this is a picture that ran in the paper. The, there's actually two foundations there. And you can't tell from that picture, but in the next one, you're going to see people walking through it. So that was on uh, the east side of Main Street. The picture on the bottom here, that was uh, Adelard Cody. He owned one of the stores. Well, he didn't own it. He rented it. But um, and Joseph Conley was the one above, and he was the one that was renting the garage. So all of that property was owned by Edwin Bennett. Um, and the property in the back uh, had two different owners. One was John Latown, who owned a stable, and the other was a Charles Roth from Connecticut. And they just rented the apartments. So this next picture, uh, this is when you can see. 
So until you put it on the computer screen, I didn't really notice, but yeah, you can definitely see the two foundations in that picture. So quite a lot of destruction. In the top right, you can see people kind of walking along Main Street. So then the papers ran great pictures of those that were made homeless. So they, uh, 80 of the 400 residents lost their homes that day and the entire church property. So Elizabeth Kibbe, who, if you remember, was one of the ones to first report the fire, uh, she ran the boarding house that was owned by John Latown. So John owned a stable, and it's the 75 chickens in the basement of that stable that perished, as well as a few little piglets. Um, Mrs. Kibbe, uh, in a long coat, didn't save really any of her stuff because she got her cat and dog out of the house. So that was quite nice. There was a report of a missing boy, six-year-old Henry Provost went missing for a little bit, but in the confusion, he just ended up with another family and they found him the next day. So had the fire started at midnight or in the evening, it probably would have been a much different outcome given the number of structures that burnt and how uh, hot the fire was. And just as another little side, being the two volunteers. Uh, so after the fire, Mr. Latown and Mr. Roth, they stopped paying their taxes, right? You're not going to pay your taxes on a building that's not there. Um, so the town ends up taking the buildings and tax title, but Mr. Latown and Miss Kibbe moved to Florida and get married. <laughs> <laughs> they had a great time. Get out of Dodge. And then this image is actually taken from Morse Road. There's a small uh, Cape House that's still on Morse Road. It was actually built in 1807. It's one of the oldest houses in the village. And this is looking towards Main Street. Um, if you look at the top, see all those burned trees? Those, I believe, are the trees between the rectory and the church. You know, because there was a, a lot of uh, large growth trees. It's funny that they don't burn completely. And then what you're seeing are the ruins of the, the big tent of the houses. But everything's just gone. So there was probably three, four, five, six houses, uh, a few barns, all in that little area, and they're all just gone. Mm -hmm. So this was like winning a lottery. So the image on the left, I don't usually like to talk about my own self, but the little girl in the middle with the name Antoinette, that's actually my meme. And that ran on the front page of the Boston Globe and it was a free weekend for newspapers.com, and that was better than winning a million dollars. So who gets to see their grandmother as almost a six-year-old? So Alice, Cody, in the right-hand picture, and Antoinette were cousins, and um, they both recounted their memories of that day to their grandchildren. Antoinette's story confirms the ringing of the town bell. Her father was Anthony Willette. He was a World War I veteran. He had been immigrated here to the town, and he had gotten married, and his family was here, and he had four children and his wife. And his sister's son, John LaFrance, whose wife is pictured in that picture with her two children, they all lived in the same tenement house. And as Antoinette was watching her father walk home for lunch, um, that bell rang. <laughs> That's why I rang the bell. So the bell rang, and her father turned around and ran back up just because they were trying to figure out how they were going to get water. They lost everything. She didn't see her father for two weeks, and they had to go stay with family in Woonsocket. Alice Cody had written her memories for her grandchildren, and she commented how her father ran a store next to the Conley's garage, and that in September of 1923, she had started at St. Anne's parochial school and all classes were taught in French. So even then, right here in 1924, in the little village of Manchog, they were all still speaking French. Um, so in the April of 1924, a huge fire broke out at a garage next to our house, and half of the village burned, the school, the church, home, my father's business. It was a very tragic experience. And then, in September of 1924, she had to go to public school which was difficult as she only spoke French, but she learned English very quickly. And then this was the Pombriand family. Uh, they were the Pombriand and the Duo families, the, the Y 
wives were sisters, and together they were a group of 16. And they saved the kitchen range, three chairs, a crib, and a tub of dishes. Um, Mr. DeVoe had been employed, unemployed since January, as were most of the head of households in the village at the time, uh, because you know the mill had closed, and then most of the people found jobs in neighboring areas. A lot of these people stay, I'm not sure. Uh, but they did resettle in Springfield, Mass. by 1930. The widow, Mrs. Leo Shaw, uh, she rented in the area, and that day she was at work, and she didn't hear about the fire until she got home. Now, she had sold the farm in Douglas in uh, 1922, the fall of 22, and she didn't put her money in the bank. She put her money all in the trunk under her bed, <laughs> and when she got home, not only was her house gone, but all her money. So the Consolidated Textile Company, that was at that point the holding company for the remaining properties of Levy and our night company, did open some of the tenement houses uh, for those that were made homeless, and that was Charlie Dukes. He was the agent at that time, so some people in the room might remember uh, Charlie Dukes' name. So the Red Cross was quick to respond. Um, they came based out of Worcester, and they immediately uh, got local people to, to volunteer to work on the project. And um, some of the people from town was George Plant, and he wrote, operated the store that's now District 5. It's a stone building up on uh, Manchow Road. His sister, Ida Plant, they said, the priest, Father Hanatel, uh, Joseph Conley, and Evelyn Kranska. And the important thing for the Red Cross from Worcester were that both George and Ida were able to translate because all the families pretty much didn't speak English. But they had two truckloads of clothing, bedding, kitchen utensils, and other necessities delivered to Manchog on each of April 17th and 18th. So there was a, a big impetus, and it was cash and and items, and the Telegram and Gazette was actually publishing all the names of anyone who gave cash. So it's, you can make quite a comprehensive list. Although I don't know if they would do that today. So, as you can see, everybody spoke French. So these are some of the papers that were running down in one socket. So that's the Sentinel. And then uh, that was L'Opinion Public, that was based in Worcester. So as I mentioned, this was in Pennsylvania, Kansas, Nebraska, Ottawa. This is also showing you that it was in English and it was in French. And, uh, and not to be beaten down, since it is Holy Week, uh, whatever was salvaged, they were able to create this outdoor kind of altar area. And if you look, off the, the heads of each of the women, you're going to see those are windows with statues in them. One might be Joseph and mm -hmm. one might be St. Anne, maybe with Mary. Um, the Sisters of the Holy Ghost went back to their home in Putnam, Connecticut, and Father Hannah Tell, who had been here from 1915 to the fire, uh, was reassigned. I, I don't know where. So now I am going to share the little controversial piece. So most people don't know that in the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan had a resurrection of activity. And the main area was New England. And there were a couple reasons for that. Um, there was a fear that with all the French immigrants that were in the New England area, uh, Woonsocket is the most French city, I think, still to this day in the country. Um, there was a feeling that because when the immigrants came down, they came with uh, their priests and their teachers and their customs, and they uh, were still speaking their language, that there was a movement by the Canadian government to annex New England. Quebec. And so there was a lot of fear going around, and so the Klan kind of got word of that, and they decided to come up and see if they could uh, rally the troops. And so in 1923, September, they burned a parochial school in Shirley. 
in January of 25, uh, they burned St. Cecilia's in Lancaster. They had burned other things, you know, throughout Canada and uh, up near Amesbury and that area, wherever the French people were. But here in Central Mass, on Saturday night, Holy Saturday, the plan decided to ignite six to 14 foot crosses uh, in various locations, Brookfield, Pigeon Hill and Grafton, and right near the Notre Dame Convent right on Plantation Street. And, um, and it's interesting because on this front page, there's the plan and there's the story of the Manchow fire. There's no, you know, we, it doesn't appear that the fire was intentionally set here. It's just interesting. It's a thing that makes you go, hmm, noon the day before, then this is all going on. Uh, and then this is a Sunday telegram for the Easter Sunday. And you can see flamingcrosses.country and the county. And then you can see that cartoon. And it might be hard, and I probably try to make it a little bigger. Sorry, now I'm your laptop. So what that is, is there's a guy that's called the fire demon, and he's got his big fiery hand, and he's grabbing St. Anne's Church. So that's just kind of interesting. And it was interesting to me because I had read other books that had kind of talked about this whole thing that was going on, and I, I went, hmm. Um, there's nothing. There's nothing written here, but I know from the memoirs of Alice Cody that the Klan had walked through Main Street in Manchester and all the Catholics had stayed in their houses. Um, she just didn't give a date. So, um, but there had been rallies in Northridge, Oxford, Millbury, Upton, and in October of 1924, 15,000 Klansmen organized themselves at the fairgrounds in Worcester. And it was called the Klan location. And the interesting thing about the way the immigrant population, Italians, Irish, and French Canadian, dealt with this, I guess you call it bullying, um, they showed up. And when the people were exiting, they threw rocks at them, they hit their cars with bats, and it, it turned into a riot. So that plan vocation in Worcester, you can find a lot of articles about that one. It was very violent. The Irish chief of police, I'm going to do one of these, <laughs> and only one person was arrested, and it planned up the message because they were not in Worcester again after that event. And then by 1926, they were pretty much out of the New England area. They just weren't able to really get the support that they were looking for for the region. So that's just a little aside. But this store here, um, this is District 5 now up on Manchuk Road. And that was a store run by George Plant. And from 1924 to 1953, the members of Manchog had their Catholic Mass on the second floor. And for anyone in this room who grew up here, you probably remember the fire escape. That was a secondary exit that was quite frightening. Um, and they probably would still be having Mass there if it hadn't been for the death of their priest, Father Gadu. When Father Gadu passed away, the bishop had to come and do the funeral mass. Well, the narrow stairway, the only way to get the coffin up the stairway is to stand up. So the bishop had never witnessed that before. So at that point, they decided to break ground. And in 1953, the St. Anne's Catholic Church, that's now St. John's Anglican Church, was, was opened and it remained open until 2013. And it was not in debt. People had all kinds of suppers and this parties and it had mortgage burning and they built the rectory and had a mortgage burning. Um, so I guess overall you'd say it was kind of a story of resilience and, and success of a, of a group of people because in the village there are still descendants of people who immigrated to Manchog in 1860, 1870. So those people are still living in the community. And then 
I was doing genealogy, and I came upon this gentleman. I was helping someone, and this gentleman passed away, and I realized, oh, he died in 1924, June of 1924. And then I found his obituary, and I said, oh, interesting. So I immediately put in, he's having a funeral at St. Anne's, and then it dawns on me, wait a second, I need to read this again. Joseph Bayset and his descendants are still in the community, was one of the wealthiest real estate owners at the time of the fire. Um, he was the wealthiest one in the Manchog area. And uh, his funeral was really huge, and it was held actually from St. Dennis Church. Because St. Anne's wasn't here anymore. <laughs> so he, his coffin didn't have to be stood up. But So in a nutshell, these are some of the names of the people that were in the fire. And just to kind of give a plug for the Historical Society, we love researching. We use all kinds of things to answer your questions. Whether you want to know who owned your house, who built your house, what might have been on your property, um, you know, who your ancestors were. So for this project, some of the things I used were, you know, census data, um, newspapers, lots of newspapers, uh, the valuation report for the town, which was, they charged you a dollar for a chicken. You had 57 chickens, you were taxed $57. And then this just kind of shows you some of the values at the time of the properties. And then, um, oh yeah, that's, that's a little house that didn't burn, and then the one next to it that was completely destroyed. And then what I went and I did is I tried to just give you a then and now. So I wasn't exactly perfect, but you can see on the left, the grass, that was all those big buildings. You can see two of the tenements, and then you can kind of see Beck's in the store versus all the housing that was there. This is the area where the fire basically started, and it, you know, it swept down towards Douglas. Um, that's the old church and rectory, and the new church and rectory flipped. So the church is really where the rectory was, and the uh, rectory is where the church kind of was. And when they built the new church, they, they built it up, you know, so that it wouldn't be so many stairs as you can see in the old church. And anyone who lived in the village also remembers the cellar hole that was um, where the old church was for quite a long time. It was just an open cellar hole. And then that's just X. And that is the Busquet House on Jarvis Ave. And you can see where the convent was off to the left in the old picture. And now you can see the church is kind of positioned kind of where the convent was. And then the hotel. Yeah, that's just in the view lot now. And, and then the little house is still pretty much the same as it was that saved all the stuff. And now there's just a small single family home. So that's it. Does anyone have any questions? Are there any other pictures? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you have all of the pictures that were available at that time. Well, there's a newspaper article from May of 1924. And if anyone's from Oxford, it was a mill owner, Charles Root. Supposedly, Charles Root had a motion picture of the fire. He, um, I was trying to build this family tree forward. The chances of it being viable, probably not. Um, no, we are always turning up new pictures. Um, Newspapers.com is what I use to, you know, get a lot of the newspapers. I do go to Vista Public Library and stock it. But newspapers.com is always uploading new newspapers. So you never know when you're going to find a picture. And that's what happened with the one with my grandmother. It was just a day. It was a free weekend because I don't pay for anything. And it took me a second. The picture pops up, and I'm like, oh, that's a fire. And then I read it, and then I went, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> this is Antoinette. So what we as a historical society want you to do is when you find that suitcase in your attic and it's full of old pictures and you go, oh, I'm going to just throw it away. If it's from Sutton or Manchot, let us look at it. Because as you can see in these pictures, sometimes it's something in the background. Um, you know, I had that picture of the woman and the girl sitting and I could see the big roof in the background. 
that was very helpful with positioning where the houses were. Um, and I was confused when I was doing it because Jarvis Ave, I was seeing a four family roof going in one direction. But from the picture with the little funny store and the three girls in front, the roof was going in a different direction. But until I got that old picture that showed me the three big multifamilies on Morse Road that you would never think were there, it was guessing. So what we do as a society is we have you fill out a form and we say, do you want the stuff back? Do you care if we throw it away? But we prefer that rather than burn it and throw it away. You know, let us look at it. It might be something that's important. And, and it's always good to repeat that to the townspeople on a regular basis because sometimes they pick things up from relatives right. um, and, and even, not knowing what it is right. because no one has ever explained it. Right, right, right. And even when you do, so I've been doing this for 25 years, sometimes when I look at a picture I have to like, hmm. Wait a bit. Uh, and then, you know, I blow it up real big and then I compare, compare it to another picture. But it's just some people like to take pictures, some people paint, and some people just like to do history. So. I, I'm from Millbury, and when we had our bicentennial, we put out an all point bulletin that we were collecting and would reproduce <coughs> any pictures that anyone had. And we did very well getting pictures uh, that were necessary to produce the book that we had printed Towns Milbury. And actually, I'm going to give an accolade right here. Chris and Nicola did that book for the 300 percent. Yes, she did. And yeah, so, and I have but, something that I say that we but, but it was because of our the historical society yeah. uh, and and putting out messages that any pictures, any pictures at all, and if you could identify them, please let us know. Uh, and and we did it four or five times uh, during a, a two-year period. And as more stuff gets loaded on ancestry and stuff, sometimes you can figure out the pictures. I had a picture of an elderly woman and a woman, and we had no idea who they were, but we didn't throw it away. Ends up, my grandfather had a half sister. So that's his mother, and that's his half sister. And, you know, when we, during COVID, we ended up going through all those old letters and everything, and that's when we figured it out. But that was 20 years from when I first saw the pictures. So, you know, you just don't know. So any other questions? Great job. Thank you.